He is considered uh, a pioneer in promoting the benefits of global investing in this country. He has authored three books. Uh, two of them I'm going to mention here, International Investment Opportunities, How and Where to Invest Overseas Successfully and Investing Without Borders. He's also the president of Adrian Day Asset Management. And he is Adrian Day and he joins us here. Adrian, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome, sir. Uh, I mentioned your first two books. I'll mention your third book in a little bit, but I wanted to mention that your first two books because I'm I'm really fascinated to get your your thoughts, insights in uh, people investing overseas. And I'm thinking of that investor, maybe that young couple, that other you know individual, whomever, where they maybe have invested here, or maybe they haven't done anything. Yeah. Advice for them dipping their toe into the overseas investments. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because to me, coming from Britain, Britain is a, first of all a small a small country. Mm -hmm. And secondly, of course, with the British Empire, we had relationships and trade everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. So growing up in England, it, it was a perfectly normal, natural thing. You didn't think about it. You didn't say, should I be investing abroad or shouldn't I? It was just a natural thing that right. if you're investing, some of it's here, some of it's there. And when I came to America, I noticed that, you know, that was completely, the attitude was completely different. And I think it was different because of the opposite of what I've just said. I mean, the United States is a huge country mm -hmm. and Canada is a huge country. So you've got lots of disparate areas in both countries, but you know, you've got agricultural and cities and everything else. And although we won't get into politics and we, we won't say America's not sticking its <laughs> nose in anywhere else, but it doesn't have the same, it doesn't have the same sort of deep, broad, relationships uh, that, that Britain did. I, I think there's also a third thing. America, as you know, the United States is very um, uh, US centric right. in everything they do. Certainly, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget working on a daily newspaper in Georgia. And, you know, it was all, all, the, all the local town news was on the front page. And you go to page three for the foreign news, right. which was what was happening in Atlanta, you know. <laughs> you, you, so America's always been very sort of uh, inward looking. Mm -hmm. and, and so people, when I first came here, people simply didn't think about investing overseas. And the adventurous ones would say, oh, yeah, I've got 10 percent in foreign investments. Yeah. And that's not the way I look at it at all, to be honest. I mean, I look at it not as domestic and international, but I look at it truly as global investing. And if you look at the, the really the um, pioneer uh, global investing, John Templeton, um, his fund, which was the best performing mutual fund for like 30 years, but his fund at different times would have as much as 85% in one country. Really? Yeah, wow. and yet it was a, the John Templeton Global Fund. And so when you're a global investor, that doesn't mean that you just diversify around the world. It doesn't mean that you only, you know, you have 15% in foreign markets and 85% domestically. Mm -hmm. It means you look for wherever the best opportunities are at any given time. And best, of course, uh, so, so if you're looking at an automobile, automobile uh, manufacturers, for example, you'll look at China and you look at South Korea and you look at Romania and you look at Brazil. And of course, different countries have discounts. Right. I mean, right now, frankly, I'd give a discount on the American car manufacturers. Um, but, but, you know, you apply discounts, mm -hmm. but you compare where are the best values. And it might be in South Korea or Korea. It might be in Brazil. It might be in the United States. Yeah. Um, and so that's the way I, that's the way I look at it. So, and, 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 you know, the other thing I'll say is over the last 50 years, since I came to America, uh, the U S things have changed completely. I mean, what is, what is a domestic U S company and what is a foreign company? Yeah, right. Nestle <laughs> yeah. headquartered in Switzerland. Is that a Swiss company? Well, they source their products and they sell their products in over a hundred different countries. Is it really Swiss? It just happens to be headquartered yeah, in Swiss. Yeah. It has a Swiss ethos, perhaps. Apple, is that really an American company? I mean, most of their manufacturing is, most of their uh, uh, product is sourced in China. Right. But manufacturers in China and, and in um, Mexico, they sell as many products in China as they do in the United States. Is that really a United yeah. States company? It's kind of become a gray area. And so things it, yeah. become really mixed. So people, I mean, I remember someone once saying, 
you know, gosh, there's so many opportunities in America, I don't need to look abroad. And, and I thought, well, why not just say there's so many opportunities in California? Mm -hmm. Why look in Nevada and, and Arizona? It, it just, I think you're just limiting yourself. Yeah. For people who haven't invested in, in foreign stocks before, um, obviously you can buy foreign stocks through a foreign mutual fund or a foreign ETF and you know, nothing wrong with that. If you're buying individual stocks, the one piece of advice I would really give people is be very, very careful of the OTC markets. So if you buy a foreign, a foreign company, HSBC Holdings, for example, which is listed on New York, mm -hmm. it's listed on New York, it's perfectly liquid, you know, small bid ask spreads, etc. It's just the same as if you're buying any New York listed stock. But if you buy a company that only trades over the counter, you're going to have very, very illiquid stocks, right. even if they're very, very large companies. So you can have, you know, 30, 50 billion dollar South Korean companies, you buy it over the counter, and you'll get a spread that might be 5% spread mm -hmm. uh, and, and great illiquidity. So be very careful of that. And some of the discounters, and I can't speak for Canadian discounters, I'm sorry, okay. but some of the discounters in the US won't accept limit orders on OTC stocks. You can imagine what happens mm. if you put a limit order, if you put a market order in a thinly traded stock. So be very careful. I would, I would say I would only buy, if you're buying individual stocks, I would only buy them if they're actually listed on an exchange, Toronto, New York, NASDAQ, mm -hmm. it could be NASDAQ. Sure. Um, uh, or they have a sponsored ADR where there's liquidity made by the sponsoring banks. Yeah. One of the other books you, you've written, I didn't mention in the intro, it's called Investing in Resources, How to Profit from Outsized Potential and Avoid the Risks. I want to talk to you about gold and silver, so I want to talk to you about gold and gold stocks. Can you give us your thoughts? Here we are relatively early in 2024. Can you give us uh, your thoughts going forward, uh, gold and silver for 2024? Yeah, uh, um, gold and silver. I think we're getting to, I think we're getting to that, um, can I say pivot? We're yeah. getting to that pivot point in, in gold and silver, in the monetary metals. Um, I've been saying for the last uh, couple of years that gold will really take off when the market understands that the Fed is going to start loosening again before they have quashed inflation. Mm -hmm. And what we actually saw in the last six months was a really strong market in physical gold, weak market in the stocks, but a strong market in the physical. I think, I think physical was the anomaly. Judging by the economic circumstances, physical gold should have been lower. Yeah. Everybody, is, everybody you know, who's in the gold market says, well, look at the disconnect, gold stocks should be higher. My answer was no, really, gold should be lower. The only reason gold held up as well as it did in the face of, you know, the most aggressive rate hiking, certainly since the end of the 70s, but I think in terms of percentages, the most aggressive rate hiking cycle ever and a strong US dollar. The only reason gold held up, of course, was because of central bank buying. So that's, so that's history. So where we are now, I, I, we are very, very close to the point where the Fed, the Fed's not going, the Federal Reserve, and um, we'll talk about other central banks in a second, but the Federal Reserve, and obviously the US is the largest economy in the world, is not going to tighten anymore. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, when are they going to start cutting? I think the market might be a little bit ahead of themselves, but, but there's very little doubt that the Fed's going to start cutting rates this year. The Fed's own Late numbers. this year, Lanny, I want to... Well... Tough to say, I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the March, the March is the next meeting after January. Mm -hmm. um, they have the Fed Funds Futures in the, in the States, which gives you a very good idea of what investors are thinking, because they're actually betting with their money. Yeah, yeah. That's about 50-50 right now on whether there'll be a rate hike in March or not. But the meeting after March is May. And by May, I think we're going to, it's going to be very clear that the economy is slowing. And May is only six months before the election. So yeah. if they want to influence the election, I'm not a conspiracy person, no. but if they want to influence the election, you know, May is about the la latest you can actually start to right. do it. So I, I think the market's right. I think March has a 50-50 uh, chance of, of a rate hike. May is virtually certain, in my view. And once they start cutting, 
you know, they're not going to do one cut and then pause for six months. Once they start cutting, I think we're going to see a series of rate cuts. Now, the important thing is, so, so they're going to start cutting rates soon, and the second thing is inflation is not quashed. Yes, you know, the CPI and the, um, what, whatever the equivalent of Canada is, they both have very similar trajectories. Right, of course, yeah. They've come down dramatically, but then they've kind of stabilized and moved up a little bit. In Canada, it's been steady for, what, two months now? Yeah. Or more than that, in no, fact. I, I was going to say uh, October. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah more than that. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the U.S., you can see it's starting to move up again. My point is that the core CPI, the PCE, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the core PCE is the Federal Reserve's own preferred measure of inflation. You know, Jerome Powell will say, we don't look at CPI and we don't, we look at, we don't look at the headline. You know, we look at uh, inflation for people who don't eat and don't... <laughs> don't, don't uh, live in a house. Um, but the core PCE, which is their own preferred measure, is still 60% yeah. above their own 2% target. So these are their own targets. So that's not, you haven't, you haven't succeeded. Right. If, if you're still 60% above your target, you haven't yet succeeded. So I think we're going to get a point when they start cutting rates and inflation remains well above their target. And I think the inflation rate, the, 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 the risk for inflation is certainly on the upside, not the downside. I'm not one of those who thinks we're going to get runaway inflation anytime soon. But just from looking at the base effect from last year, I mean, one of the reasons that inflation has been, that numbers have been so low in September, October, November, December, January is because of a base effect from last year. Mm -hmm. Well, that base effect come May, April, um, May, June, July, August will reverse and we'll start seeing higher year-on-year -year comparisons. And that's apart from if the oil price moves up. Uh, one of the quotes I, I, you mentioned in uh, an interview I saw, you were talking about elections coming up and it's only 10 months away, it's a biggie. Um, you made a comment here that I, I want you to, <laughs> to talk about. You've stated that a recession is coming and also that quote, people who think we're going to have a soft landing because we haven't had a recession yet. I think they haven't studied history, but they're also living in a cloud cuckoo <laughs> land, <laughs> in my view. Um, yeah, for people that are thinking that, could you want to just uh, expand on yeah, that a little well, bit, please? Yeah, well, look, not, nothing's inevitable in economics. No, of course. Change, but I, yeah. think, I think a recession in the U.S. and in Europe, Europe's probably already in a recession, and in Britain, but let's just look at the U.S. A recession in the U.S. is as close to inevitable as anything mm -hmm. in, in, in the investment economic world. And, uh, you know, all the indicators, the leading in the economic index, um, you know, they're all pointing towards a recession. Now, people who are in the soft landing camp or the no landing camp will say two things. One is, look at unemployment, Janet Yellen says yeah, this. Yeah. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, is an employment economist. That's what she studied at university, that's a PhD. But she says, you can't have a recession when unemployment rate is so low. And that is just absolute baloney. And I wish she was sitting in front of us because I'd use yeah, stronger yeah. words. If you look at the last, if you look at every recession back to the 1950s, you see the unemployment rate is at its absolute lowest immediately before, before. a recession starts. And, and um, so to say that because unemployment rate is low, we're not going to have a recession, it just flies in the face of history. The other thing you hear a lot of is, well, look, they've raised rates from zero lower bound to five and a half percent in the US. We haven't had a recession yet. We've escaped it we've, we, because we've done all this. We've had two years. We haven't had a recession. But, but Jerome Powell himself, Jerome Powell, the uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve, for people who don't, mm. um, you know, he himself keeps talking in his press conferences about these long and variable lags. And he says one of the reasons that they, they halted raising rates before inflation was, was killed, is this was before, you know, December when he turned dovish, but was because of the long and variable lags. We want to wait to see, we want to wait to see what the full impact of what we've already done is. And the truth is that we have not yet seen the full impact of what the Fed has already done. The average lag time from the, from the start of a rate hiking cycle, from the first rate hike until the onset of a recession, is 27 months. So we are, even now, we are mm -hmm. still well below that average. 
significantly below that average. So to say because we've been, uh, you know, 20 months now uh, without a recession, absolutely does not mean that we are not going to get a recession. These lags take a long time to work through and you only have to look at, and, and I think if anything, the lag could be longer this time because we had, you know, years, 10 years of excessively easy monetary policy and excessively low interest rates, which enable people, households and corporations to refinance, to refinance, to pay off debt. So in the, in the US, as you know, we have these fixed 30 year mortgages, yeah. which I think is the greatest, second greatest gift of America to the world. The first greatest gift is turn right on red. That is, you know, <laughs> okay. why didn't anyone think of that earlier? I was going to say jazz, but uh, well, turn right jazz. on red is pretty up there as well. But, but you know, the 30 year mm -hmm. fixed mortgage means that virtually everyone, virtually everyone yeah. in the US has a 30 year fixed in uh, income. Some have a shorter mortgage, 20 year, and some, but very few will have a variable rate. Most people have a 30 year fixed. Everybody I know refinanced in the last uh, yeah. you know, eight years. Everybody refinanced at two, two and a half, three percent. So that means the households generally were in better shape going into this uh, uh, rate hacking cycle. And corporations, of course, did the same thing. Not all corporations have fixed fixed rates on their on their interest, of course, but they turned out their debt. So the 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 story, if you like, that I like to say to people is: think of a company could be a small company or it could be a major company. But in 2018, 2019, they refinanced all of their debt and termed it out so the five years was the shortest and 10 years was the longest. Well, 2019, five years, 2024, what the Fed's already done hasn't affected them. Mm -hmm. But come next year, they will be refinancing at LIBOR plus four, LIBOR plus five. Yeah. It's not LIBOR anymore. Anyway. Yeah, yeah but whatever it's called now, SOFA or something, same thing. But they'll be refinancing at double the rate that they had before. That's meaningful. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so the point I'm making is monetary policy works with long lags. It works with long lags because it affects different people, different households, different corporations at, at different stages. Automobiles, for example, you've re, you bought an, a used car five years ago, you financed it, rates were really low. Great. Maybe next year you have to replace your car. Yeah. You know, and then and then you're paying twice as much as you were for your first car loan. So all these things have significant effects, but they take time. So I think I think the odds. I mean, I think I think a recession is virtually inevitable. Next year? No, later this year. Later this I year. I think it's going to become apparent later this year. Yeah. The only offsetting thing would be how dramatically the Fed. And frankly, it's not just the Federal Reserve with monetary policy, it's the administration with, or the government with um, a fiscal policy. Mm. You know, are they going to just uh, try to get too much stimulus out to people to keep the economy going? Um, but I think it's gonna be this year. Adrian, thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, thank it's you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's Adrian Day, president of Adrian Day Asset Management. More uh, information on Adrian, you can go to adriandayassetmanagement.com. Uh, thank you, sir. Pleasure thank to talk you. to you. Well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you.